mute your audio and switch off the video to ensure smooth conduct of the webinar. Feedback forms will be posted in the chat box as a Google link, which will accept responses soon after the end of the day. All participants are requested to submit the feedback forms at the end of each day so as to ensure your attendance. And this is essential for the preparation of your e-certificates. Today we have with us Dr. John Shins Matthew, Executive Director, Jersey City, New Jersey. Dr. Matthew, after completing bachelor's degree in veterinary sciences, took his master's degree and PhD from Oklahoma State University. He was associated with the Harvard Medical School for his residency in experimental pathology. He took his MBA from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Dr. Matthew had been working in Merck from 2000 to 2021. He is now the executive director of Organon, which is a spin-off company of Merck. Today, he will be speaking to us on strategies for vaccine development and advantages and disadvantages of current COVID-19 vaccines. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Now the platform is all yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes, 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 sir. OK, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you for the nice words uh, about me and also appreciate your invitation to share my thoughts around the COVID vaccines and va vaccine development programs, as well as the comparative efficacy of various vaccines based on the information that we have today. And as you know that this field has evolved rapidly over the course of last, I would say, around six, 18 months since last December, January timeframe in 2020. And so every day that we learn something new about not only the disease, but also the vaccines themselves and how they behave in people and what kind of efficacy that these vaccines renders to people and also the, the, the number of variants that are actually coming in uh, into the world in different parts um, as the as the pandemic progresses. So I'm going to try to give you um, an idea from a pharmaceutical company uh, perspective, um, how this is actually being approached and uh, how this is actually being um, in perceived uh, from an efficacy standpoint. So I know since we have a lot of people, it may be difficult uh, to ask questions during the presentations, but please um, raise uh, um, you know questions through maybe the chat room. And maybe once I finish it, I don't have too many slides. The idea was maybe if there is a need, we can have a further discussion during this call, during the time that we have. And rather than um, you know, I am being delivering a monotonous speech, so I have only over nine or ten slides, and we will try to get through those, and then certainly can have a few questions at the end. Okay, so let me try my desktop and hopefully it will work. Can you see my screen now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Sir. Okay, so I yes, actually, yes. as I said, I will definitely, uh, I will mention the development of vaccines for COVID the various vaccine platforms that are employed, the immunogenicity of these vaccines and the vaccination data. I will show a couple of examples from the US vaccination program. That's one of the most advanced, uh, very close to or right behind the data that we have in Israel. Okay, before I, before I start, I'm, I'm sure being students and faculty of microbiology, you have a very good understanding of the pathogenesis of this particular virus. And as you can see on the left hand side, I don't want you to read through this, but the idea what I was wa I wanting to convey that the spike proteins, which are the spikes uh, depicted in a virus cartoons, are the critical component of a, the entry into the cell. And that is facilitated through uh, an ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2. That's the receptor in the cells that actually facilitate that entry into the cell. It's very interesting that if you actually search in the literature why this particular virus is actually more uh, dangerous to the older 
people compared to the younger people, particularly in less than 10 years old, we actually can see that the receptor expression uh, itself, that's one of the hypotheses, is the receptor expression itself is actually much lower in the case of very young people. That means the younger boy, uh, younger children, rather than in older people who are actually above 80. So that's one of the theories postulated why this disease is more severe in the uh, older general, older people compared to the younger people. And even in younger people, if you look at uh, people from 18 to 55, the comparative uh, disease, the disease progression is actually much better or the progression of the infection is much better and the prognosis is much better in younger people than older people. Again, we are still <clears throat> learning why it is like that and also why certain people in their 30s and 40s develop severe disease and actually end up succumbing to the disease compared to countless others who actually have essentially no symptoms or are successful in uh, surviving this infection. All of that will come out in the coming days. There's a lot of postulations or hypothesis why it's happening like that, but it's very difficult at today's um, you know, knowledge that to predict who actually becomes severely ill and die of this illness compared to uh, others. So, and also as you have seen over the course of last 16 months, there's a lot of uh, funny treatments and all kinds of stuff that people have actually postulated um, in, the, in, the, in the news media. And many of them were literally bogus. And also even in India, as you can imagine, even some politicians actually propagated certain type of uh, weird treatments. But I think that's where you know the microbiologists and scientists have to literally speak up and educate people. It's not speaking up in social media, but actually educating people. And your role actually become extremely important so that people actually take care of themselves rather than follow um, this very, I would say, interesting interesting uh, tre treatment regimes. Even in the US, we actually had a stint of uh, buying out chloroquine in large numbers because our president actually, for some reason, believed that was an effective treatment, which turned out to be not so. So those are actually some of the, you know, the, the things when a new pandemic comes, obviously there's a lot of uh, predictions like that. But I think I just wanted to emphasize as infectious diseases experts and, and students, you have to continuously educate the people around you um, the importance of, uh, you know, all the, um, you know, the social distancing, masking, and a lot of those actually people don't take it seriously. And I think we all have that social responsibility. I just wanted to highlight that that as well as, uh, as uh, uh, students of infectious diseases, including myself. And so as we actually see the progression of this disease, the virus actually cause, especially those who are severely affected, uh, you know, something that we now predict as a cytokine storm, and some doctors actually even disputes that. But what is essentially happening is they are destroying the type 2 pneumocytic, pneumocytes, that is the alveolar epithelial cells in the lungs, that's the at the microscopic level, which affects actually the, the oxygen exchange uh, between the atmosphere and our bloodstream. And that's where most of the patients actually succumb to. And that results in, you know, that cytokine response to the viral infection causes severe pneumonia and which progress to eventually hypoxia and death. And then due to the cytokine storm in some patients, at least it actually have multi-organ failure. And that's how they actually succumb to the death as well. So again, this is actually a, you know, a controversy out there in all, all countries where how they record COVID deaths and uh, how what they actually really shows as the cause of the death which uh, you know some countries play the play the numbers to show that they don't have as much covid related death compared to others but again as you grow up in in your field in microbiology uh, or you know infectious diseases it's always important to accurately depict the numbers because what it helps is actually people to understand the epidemiology of the disease and also to really elicit a response that is worthy enough to contain in an infectious outbreak infectious diseases outbreak if you artificially lower the numbers people won't take it seriously people may not actually put the resources behind it so all of that is actually critical again i just wanted to remind 
uh, all of us continuously that you know this is all of the epidemiology and the you know the control the proper treatment all of that is important in any any infectious diseases outbreak so when it comes to vaccines as i said the critical piece is that interaction between the spike protein and ace2 res, uh, receptor and so the vaccines were all focused on, all of the vaccines actually were focused on, um, you know, seeing how we can actually prevent that entry of the virus into the cell, because once it enters, it definitely going to multiply and release large number of viruses, okay? So in a vaccine development, traditionally, right? So this is actually going, it's going to be a very interesting topic in the future, right? Traditionally, the vaccine development programs used to take anywhere from, you know, five to 10 plus years. And the reason behind is, as you can see in this particular slide, they have to really find a target and they have to validate the target. Validating the target means in this case, you know, that um, spike protein is actually, a, you know, determining that that's a good target and the target actually when we target that protein, it prevents the virus from either entering the cell or causing a disease is actually very important. And then once you have a target and then you decide uh, what kind of uh, platform that you're going to develop in order to produce that vaccine, it goes through what we call in pharmaceutical industry as a preclinical stage. What that means is we do not put that into human beings, but rather test it in various animal species, depending on the type of vaccine and the type of target that we are going after. And then there is a period of actually, you know, using something in the laboratory at a small, you know, very small quantities enough to dose a mice or, you know, any other animal is not sufficient for a large number of clinical trial, large number of people that who will be enrolled in a clinical trial. So the most important part of uh, the next step is to develop a process by which we can scale up these vaccines. And as we scale up, we cannot lose the efficacy of that vaccine. So that's a process in, by itself. And then the, the next step is actually to really make sure that we have a robust protocol to do the clinical trial. And also there is a, there is a, there is a robust analysis of that outcome of that clinical trial with the right assays, et cetera, especially if you're in a vaccine development program, you want to know your antibody response as well as cell mediated response against an infectious agent. So that'll take some time. And some of sometimes it actually goes in parallel. And, and until now, the mRNA vaccines that actually came into the into the world through this COVID infection, the 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 vector based vaccines etc the manufacturing process is actually quite cumbersome so it's important to make sure that the the process is robust enough and uh, quality you know of high quality so that it can it can actually use to dose in the human being so the phase 1 study typically typically right it's a it's a study to determine whether a medicine or a drug or a vaccine is actually safe uh, in the human beings. It's actually done in healthy volunteers. It's actually completed in an extremely, um, you know, he high healthcare environment because the, when this is the first time we are going to put something into a human being and we have no idea how that person is going to react. And why it is so important is even though the preclinical studies uses animals and even monkeys for to make sure that the, the dose toleration, et cetera, is actually assessed, but human beings are a completely different uh, species. So the species variation is important and extremely critical in the case, understanding that in the case of, um, uh, in the case of uh, any development pro medical or medicine or actually vaccine development program. But the interesting thing is we only use about 10 to 15 people for the study and they're actually kept in a hospital. They monitor continuously how they react to it. But using such low, small number of people only give you so much indication with respect to uh, you know the the safety of the vaccine it only provides an immediate reaction to the your dosing and they are monitored for a few days and making sure there is no immediate reaction in the phase 2 study actually a little more elaborate you have maybe hundreds of people 
And you here you look at not only safety, but also look at your immune response, particularly in the case of vaccines, to make sure that you do get a desired immune response and you collect the blood, et cetera, and you're making sure that you actually have the, uh, the right immune response and they are neutralizing against the target that you're going after. Phase three is actually usually a large clinical trial, multi-center, that multiple parts of the world as uh, it allows thousands of patients. So I remember that when Merck developed a vaccine against the rotavirus, that clinical trial enrolled 86,000 children uh, before it got approved. So it's a very expensive and extremely involved trial that actually happens. And, and one of the most difficult thing about this trial is in any situation, this pandemic is an exception, which I'll explain later, but in normal circumstances, you have both control group as well as your vaccinated group, and you have to have a minimum number of infections in the control group uh, before you can declare your trial is actually a success. So in a normal circumstances, to get that many people or infected people in the control group, it take, that's why it takes a large number of um, uh, people to be enrolled in a phase three trial in order to accomplish that. In addition to that, the outcomes that we are going to measure is actually predetermined. So you cannot change along the way unless there is a special application to amend it. But the idea is how you actually measure the outcome of vaccine is also equally important. And that's what actually determines the efficacy at the end of the day. And if you have known variants in the uh, in the in, in, in the world, and then you also try to assess the efficacy against those variants. And because it is a long term study, it also looks at the longevity of immune response. And also it actually will be able to have a better idea around the side effects of the vaccine because people are followed through for a for a substantial amount of time. And why it's actually done in multi-center in multiple countries is that over time that we have learned that even the vaccine response and immunogenicity definitely vary by uh, different populations and also by different geography uh, because of various reasons, actually, because your immune system is modulated by even what you eat and what the prevailing um, conditions that you live in and all of that and the other co-infections that you get over your lifetime. So that's one of the reasons why in most countries it's actually required that even after approval in another country, for example, today Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine is not available in India, is ICMR or the Indian regulatory agency, DCGI, insists that they need to do a phase four or a phase trial in India in a few patients to demonstrate the vaccine is efficacious. So it's a normal process that many regulatory agencies require that the medicine or the vaccine is safe in their own population before it's, wide, it's made widely available. So during this whole process, and also then there is a regulatory review that usually takes a substantial amount of time. Again, we have uh, made a lot of progress in the case of, in the case of COVID in how fast the regulatory approval actually took place. So if you look at the six to or five to 10 year development program, in the case of COVID, it was compressed to less than 12 months. And how that was possible, there are predominantly a couple of reasons. One, in many a couple of countries, at least in India and Russia, the Sputnik vaccine and the core vaccine that's made by Bharat Biotech, in, the governments gave the go ahead <clears throat> to market and those people even before a phase three trial. They both were highly controversial, but given the urgency of putting something uh, in the arms of people in order to protect the infection, the both countries determined that it's better to err on that side rather than waiting for an elaborate phase three trial. Whereas in the case of Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, they all did an elaborate phase three trial and they were able to conclude that phase three trial very quickly is because it's a pandemic, large number of patient population available for, uh, or exposure available for both control and affected group. And plus this disease is actually extremely quick, right? Once you get the infection within three to five days, you show symptoms and within two to three weeks, you actually either recover or you actually go into a severe disease. So it was possible for them to uh, do the phase three trial pretty quickly. So what they have assessed through that about eight months process is 
for the, at least in the short term, the vaccine is safe in large number of people. As you can imagine, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Moderna, they actually in, in, enrolled more than 30,000 people. Whereas in the case of Covaxin, they only started phase three trial in January or February this year. They will also have about 28,000 people enrolled in. The data is not complete yet. They haven't completed the trial, but the interim data shows that it's actually still, uh, the, the original pro projections were still uh, true. In the case of Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, they didn't have any data and they finally published the data by saying they have 86% efficacy among, I think, about 10,000 people or so. They have done the clinical trial in Russia. And, and so the, the safety of the vaccine is actually now not only, knows, uh, not only known based on this eight months of clinical trials, but also now large number of people are actually dosed with these vaccines across the world. So we now know whether the, especially the immediate safety and people are extremely comfortable with the safety profile of most of these vaccines because, and they have seen that in, in people. Uh, based on the number I saw in John, John Hopkins University yesterday was two, 2 billion doses has been delivered so far for these vaccines across the globe. It's an unprecedented accomplishment for a disease that was only known about 18 months ago. And the second, as I said, the vaccine can produce an immune response, both humoral and cell mediates is important. And the third important criteria that they actually look at is, or we look at it is not only they produce an immune response uh, when we dose the vaccines, those immune responses are protective because we target spike protein and all the, you know, we may have very good immune response against spike proteins. However, if that doesn't protect the, the people from getting the infection, it's actually an absolute waste. The vaccine is not useful. And the fourth thing is the longevity of immune response. Usually, we have a very good idea what the longevity before a vaccine comes to the market. In the case of COVID, we did not have the luxury because we wanted to roll out that vaccine in the absence of any effective treatment. So we are still studying it based on the data that we have latest, actually as of May. We know that both Pfizer and, and Moderna, which actually started vaccinations initially, have a protective effect at least up to eight months. And also this is actually compared to the natural infection as well. And finally, the other criteria we look at is whether the vaccine have protection against the variants. And in this case, we did not study a whole lot um, because the variants is actually evolving as the studies are ongoing. So for example, Pfizer and Moderna did not study any variants as when they were doing the clinical trials because variants were not readily apparent. Whereas in the case of Johnson & Johnson, when they did the clinical trials, without even them knowing in South Africa and Brazil, the patient populations had the South Africa and Brazil variants in the in this clinical study. So they could actually report data based on that. Then finally, the selection of vaccine doses. That's very important. This is actually quite controversial in India as well as you have heard that people have actually you know, started extending the timing between the doses um, again, that is to, to make sure people at least get one dose, even though we don't have a definitive studies on these things actually for many of the vaccines. Because what we know now is in the case of in India, Covaxin, you have to give one second dose within 28 days. And in the case of AstraZeneca, it is between four and 12 weeks. But we have seen people actually saying we could even go six months, probably possible, but those are all uh, predictions based on the data that they have seen rather than actual results. Finally, actually, the, the next uh, topic I wanted to discuss is the different vaccine platform. Some of you may be familiar with this, and but otherwise, I'll just go through those uh, um, anyway. So some of the early vaccines uh, against viruses included what we have on the on the on your right side on the top, primarily attenuated virus, which are viruses that are not as virulent as the uh, as the the infectious agent and somewhat weakened, and then also inactivated viruses. So we have two, uh, one vaccine in the attenuated criteria. It's being developed by Indian Immunologics. It hasn't come to the market yet. We don't know a lot about them. In the case of inactivated virus, we have Sinopharm and Bharat Biotech. Again, they are very fast. We can develop them because you are not really doing a whole lot of engineering there, other than you're actually taking the whole virus and you inactivate them and then you find a way to deliver this and hope that you will have an immune response. So the Bharat Biotech, um, they claim around 80%, 85% effective. Sinopharm is actually very similar. However, 
what is interesting about Sinopharm is in, in, in a particular case in Peru, uh, which is in South America, if you don't know, they have used uh, Sinopharm extensively in their population for vaccination. However, what they now finding out is there is a vaccine breakage and the infection rate is actually extremely high in, in, in Peru at this point. So people are trying to figure out what exactly happened there. And similarly, in some Middle Eastern countries like Qatar, they had a, a vaccine breakage as well. And so now they are actually following up all the people with Pfizer vaccination, for example. In the case of Bharat Biotech, as I said, uh, let's hope that it is actually safe and efficacious and it actually do provide protection and we will have a lot more data as they conclude the phase three trial. But the interim results are certainly promising. In the case of uh, the other platform, the next platform is actually the using a viral vector. And, you know, as infectious diseases students, you may be familiar with. In many cases, people use a much more, um, you know, benign viruses like a common cold virus. That's what Oxford, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson and Sputnik vaccine employs. And in the case of Merck, Merck has a very robust platform where it's a replicating vesicular stomatitis virus that's modified that will continue to produce the proteins over time, which actually helps versus a non-replicating virus. However, the MERT program was terminated because it did not actually elicit a desired immune response in monkeys. Whereas, as you can see now that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as the, the same vaccine that is marketed as Covishield in India, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and Sputnik, um, they use adenovirus vectors that actually um, are, are effective in giving the protection. And in the case of Sputnik, they did an interesting thing, unlike uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, they actually again have two doses, but they use two different adenoviruses for the two doses, which is kind of interesting. We don't know why they did that. Their argument was they the first dose will, will produce a neutralizing antibodies, and those antibodies will not um, impact the effectiveness of the second dose. And that's why they went, went uh, uh, that methodology. But it gives a lot of complications, as you can imagine, because now you have to develop two different processes. And essentially, you're developing two different vaccines between the first and the second dose. Whereas AstraZeneca and J&J, they have the uh, very similar processes. OK, so if you come to the left hand side, if you, you there, you actually have nucleic acid based vaccines. So we have Moderna and Pfizer. They both produces, they uses a messenger RNA vaccine. Again, this is the first time an mRNA vaccine became shown to be effective against an infectious disease. There was a lot of, there were a lot of research over the course of last 10 years in the delivery mechanism of mRNA vaccines, because the difficulty was how do we make sure that the mRNA doesn't chewed up after you dose it and before it enters the cell and then the cell is able to produce uh, a desired protein before the mRNA get destroyed in, inside the cell. So they developed that technology uh, by using uh, lipid coating. And that's why those vaccines are actually highly um, sensitive when it comes to temperature. And so they found a way to administer that. And that's actually um, has turned out to be extremely efficacious against COVID. And that was a huge luck for the human population, I would say, because um, the vaccine is easy to manufacture. So you can manufacture millions and millions of doses in a very short period of time. And so they both are approved and they both are a similar efficacy and, uh, uh, and, and the immune response profiles. Whereas DNA vaccines, they often use a plasmid to insert the desired target. And there are two vaccines in development, one by a company called Inovio, another one by an Indian company called Cytos Cadillac. So if they are successful in developing these vaccines, this is the first DNA vaccine that developed for humans and administered for humans. So we are actually waiting for the approvals. And there are a lot of concerns about both mRNA versus DNA vaccines because you know, there's a concern what's the long-term impact of these plasmids in the cells. So that may be one of the difficulties in getting these approvals uh, without having that data uh, data in, but there are some animal vaccines that are developed uh, using the DNA uh, uh, technology. However, some are effective and some are not effective. And the latest uh, vaccine, most promising vaccine is the top one called Novavax that is actually using the actual S protein 
and they are actually utilizing converting that into a nanoparticles and they are in injecting it. There's so far the clinical trial shows they're extremely efficacious and they're actually waiting for an uh, emergency use authorization for their vaccine. So obviously in that case, the protein is actually being directly injected. Um, again, the long term impact of that, you know, again, we don't have that data, but at least from the efficacy standpoint, they're actually shown to be extremely promising. So these are actually the primary strategies or platforms that actually people have used for developing COVID vaccines. And other than what is mentioned here, there are countless other vaccines that are under development using any of these variations of any of these technologies, but we have to wait and see um, you know, how they will, will pan out. But when you think about the disease itself, right, in the lot of predictive models says that 70% of a, the population needs to be vaccinated or have natural immunity from the natural occurring disease in order to acquire a herd immunity to contain the virus. So when you have a population of seven and a half billion people around the world, and if you want to immunize or have the natural infection in uh, at least five billion people, it takes a lot of effort and time to do the vaccination. And if it is, if it only depends on natural immunity, you will have a large number of people uh, have to die before we actually get there. So that's why the importance of these vaccines, and that's the reason why all the regulatory agencies around the world accelerated the review and approval process and provided emergency use authorization, which is a, a, a typical terminology that regulatory agencies use in order to provide approval in a very quick uh, fashion. So, you know, from an mRNA vaccines perspective, um, you know, I don't want, again, it's probably too small for you to read. The idea is you have the mRNA sequence for the spike protein. It's actually coated by lipid. It actually directly dosed to human beings. And after dosing, the <coughs> lipid uh, coating actually helps the mRNA from destroyed by the body's immune system. They enter the cells. And once they enter the cells, they make copies of the spike proteins and then antibodies are developed against those spike proteins. So that's how this actually uh, the works. However, even though the vaccines have developed so fast, naturally it also created a lot of confusion among people. So at least in the US early on, and the biggest challenge for convincing people to take vaccine are these, is these issues that are um, highlighted on the right-hand side. And the initial thinking was, I think the vaccine may not be safe enough. So that is because, as I said earlier, usually it takes about three to six years to develop a vaccine. And when you have a vaccine in about 10 or 12 months, naturally people have the suspicion, do, does it really have an effective, uh, it is really, really effective. But in the case of US, at least we knew that these Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer vaccine had, you know, an extensive phase three trials with data. That's how it got approved. So it took a lot of communication and convincing among people to trust those vaccines rather than waiting for, um, you know, or, or, or contracting the actual disease. And the second issue was I am concerned about possible side effects. So this is actually more interesting because when you have, when you think about side effects, there are nothing that you administer into a human body is 100% safe because you are bringing something from outside, you are putting it inside that is not normal, right? So the, um, the extent of uh, side effects is what is actually going to drive it. So as we were actually dosing people early on in the US, there were actually a few people who had anaphylactic reactions against the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And uh, there was also some uh, disseminated clotting in the case of Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And then in addition to that, all, all three vaccines actually produced a certain classic side effects of an immune response, which is body pains, a slight fever, which lasts around 24 to 36 or 48 hours after the second dose, particularly in the case of uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. So, the, however, as more and more people actually um, got vaccinated, it has realized, it became an apparent that the side effects associated with uh, Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were much, much smaller than even their comparable vaccines because after millions and millions and millions of doses, we have only a handful of side effects. And there is only so far, I think, only one or two deaths um, in, in the U.S., 
as you can imagine, 159 people, 155 million people are fully vaccinated. So that means 15.5 crores, which is 50% of the US population. There's only one or two deaths uh, from these vaccines. So they're extremely safe vaccines based on the data that we have so far. And the third misconception is, I do not believe COVID-19 is dangerous for my health, which is again, extremely uh, ill-informed um, idea that some people said, I don't care, I actually want to get COVID. Once I get COVID, I'll be protected. But unfortunately, as I described earlier, until you contract the illness, you don't know how your body is going to react. And each body is going to react differently. And it not only costs, you know, if you happen to be one of the, uh, you know, unfortunate, you cause not only a severe disease for yourself, you may survive, but you have long-standing complications, or you actually die. And or if thirdly, you may survive without death as well as long-term complications, but it bring an enormous strain on the healthcare system. Because as we have seen in India, hospital beds will run out hospital beds, run out of oxygen as more people get infected. And we had that situation back in uh, September, October timeframe as well, not having enough hospital beds. So those are all actually the complications and people actually believe, you know, the misbeliefs that I actually rather get COVID-19 than, um, than getting a vaccine. And then there is a, another group of people, they reject vaccination on principle. They just don't like to vaccinate uh, themselves or their kids. Again, education and continuous education is important. Again, that's where the role of uh, especially infectious diseases, uh, students and uh, scientists actually become extremely, extremely important. And I think we have being vocal in our society in, in a way that actually motivates people and educating people is always, I personally think a lot of people appreciate because many times people reject this or don't take it because of a lot of misconceptions people have. And if you can spend 10 minutes explaining how it works and what it actually does, sometimes you can actually change a person. And sometimes it's religious as well. Some, you know, religious uh, sects actually advocate against these things. Again, it's it's challenging for infectious diseases experts and uh, countries to to make sure that how you educate those people. And again, the finally, as I said, it's best to let take natural nature to take its course. Again, it's a very bad idea in a disease like this. And uh, nature will take its course, but the damage will be catastrophic. And it, it's actually, you know, as not only it's a personal death and other things, but also it is going to it is going to be extremely difficult for those who are living. And as you can, you are experiencing now the the uh, the lockdowns. It is having an enormous impact on, especially those who do not have um, a stable uh, monthly salary in a governmental sector, uh, because. What it does is the daily daily laborers and uh, people who actually earns, uh, in, especially in private uh, enterprises, they don't make any money, and governments can offer a certain amount of ration and stuff to help the help to ease the situation, but that doesn't help them from paying off their debts and all of that. So, the economically, the damage that is bring you know these kinds of infections bring to the population is uh, you cannot even imagine. That's why. Sometimes that taking the natural course, yes, it's actually may, may be a good idea, but that doesn't work in the current world because of the complexity and how entangled we are uh, in both in our livelihood as, our, as well as our financial health. So that's where why this is actually, these are the kind of situations that people have these misconceptions and we need to continuously educate people to, to take the vaccine. And that's where the data become more and more and more important. As more data is shared, people take, get more trust in this. So just a quick comparison of uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. I know, unfortunately, it is not available in India at this at this stage. But when we, this is the initial data that we have actually seen, as well as the number of people vaccinated as of now. So as I said, more than 30,000 people enrolled in both trials, clinic phase three trials. They both actually need two doses. One is 28 days apart, other one is 21 days apart. Why that is actually, it's because that's the regimen that they chose when they decided to do the phase three clinical trials. Can Pfizer vaccine work at 28 days apart? Probably it can, but they did not study that. And the age group, Moderna was about 18, Pfizer was originally about 16, but now they have completed the trial and got the approval for kids as young as 12. And so my kids are vaccinated, to be honest, my youngest is 16 and actually just turned 16, but he got vaccinated earlier. And the effectiveness is pretty robust, it's 94, 95% effective. 
And the, but the difficulty with these two vaccines is the storage conditions. As you can see here, one actually around minus 20, 15 to 25. The other one is less than minus 70. So this is becoming a problem, even though we actually here in India, I actually had a discussion with Asia and it actually on this actually late, late last year or actually early this year. And the, even though the Pfizer and Moderna is available and Indian India government can actually purchase based on uh, the availability of the doses from these companies, the difficulty for us is to maintaining the cold chain because how do we ensure that less, minus 70 or less freezers are available in every location and it is actually continuously maintained in that way because power outages needs to be backed up with generators, for example, in order for the longevity of these vaccines. Because once they come to regular refrigerator, they are only good for five days and room temperature for two to six hours after opening. So that's what the most difficult thing about a mRNA vaccine. So the, the infrastructure for distribution is becoming, will become a big issue in India if once those vaccines are actually going to come in, whereas other vaccines don't have such stringent uh, temperature requirements. Okay, as I said, the side effects are very mild. It's mostly um, the regular effects you can expect in an immune reaction. However, in both these cases, they they have reported uh, a few cases, very few cases of anaphylaxis reaction. So, typically, when we take these vaccines, people are not allowed to leave the vaccine facility up to 15 minutes. And if you have severe allergic uh, reactions history. Uh, for other things in the past, then they will expect people to stay there for about uh, 30 minutes before they leave home, go home. Longevity of protection, currently we know that at least 10 months, the, both uh, cell-mediated as well as humoral response is present and that are protective. And both companies are developing on a booster or a follow-up dose and determining what that dose should be and also when that dose should be administered. And the immune response, I guess, is that both are there. And in the case of number of people, number of uh, people vaccinated to date is 62 million with Moderna vaccine, and Pfizer had about 83 million in the U.S. And Pfizer also supplied outside the U.S., so there is a large number dosed with Pfizer vaccines outside the United States. As I said, anaphylaxis is less than one in one million, so it's actually not a terrible situation, and you can actually treat. Uh, using epinephrine, for example, when it happens. And very only very few, very handful, very few people who actually had to stay in the hospital uh, overnight uh, after experiencing this. So, <clears throat> as I said, this is actually the just the summary, uh, um, you know, when, how, how many, what's the age group and uh, how many doses and when are you fully vaccinated um, after the final dose, right? And one of the interesting thing about this AstraZeneca vaccine and Johnson & Johnson, as I mentioned earlier, they both use exactly the same system. So the Johnson & Johnson requires only one shot, uh, whereas the AstraZeneca, they require or they recommend two doses, but the distance between the first and second dose can be as long as 12 weeks. And now they even recommend, um, you know, even six months in some cases in order to accelerate the vaccination process. So there has to be an immunity for AstraZeneca as well uh, after the first shot, um, two weeks after your first dose. So I just wanted to show you a dramatic um, effect of vaccination in the US and, and shows that it actually works. So back in January, we had only 1.1% of the population is actually vaccinated. You can see on the graph on the left on the top, and we had about 756 daily cases per million people at that time. So over time, if you come to the right hand side, come to June, six months later, we have about 48, 49% of our population is now fully vaccinated. And our daily cases are actually now 43 per million. And if you double click on that, and if you go to the details, you actually, see, we can see that that 43 is predominantly in states where the vaccination uptake is actually lower than other states, especially states like New Jersey, Massachusetts, where Boston is. They're all highly vaccinated states. We are approaching 70%. Our daily infection is actually much, much smaller, and the death is also actually much, much smaller. So vaccine is definitely works, and we just need to have a, you know, a substantial amount of people vaccinated. It is going to be a challenge in India with 140 crores people, right? 1.4 billion people in order to get 60% or 70% vaccinated. It takes a lot of time and it requires a concerted effort by the government. 
And I'm glad to learn that recently the government decided to vaccinate people for free. And every other country has done that because that's the only way you actually get the compliance required. And because it is a national crisis, it's more, not more important than anything else to make sure that your, your people are healthy, uh, both physically as well as financially, and vaccination actually gets you there. And the money that go governments invest in that is actually a, a huge gain long term for the country. I'm so glad that finally government decided to do that. So when you look at look back in, in India versus in the US, we both countries had interesting situations. Back before the current government came to existence, there's a lot of, um, uh, I would say, conflicting messages and conflicting strategies within the government during the Trump presidency. And that has gone away and it become a lot more scientifically driven strategy during the Biden administration. And that helped to contain a lot of noise it also helped to have a very solid, very good solid strategy around vaccinating the people and the messaging was consistent, et cetera. So if you look back in India in the last, I would say last four to six months, the similar situation actually happened. My hope is that currently with the latest announcement of free vaccines, as well as the government is actually taking, you know, maybe more and more depending on solid scientific advice in decision making will help because political decision making often uh, can have uh, a, a substantial negative impact in a pandemic like this. You know, I'm not <laughs> whether to any one political party or politicians, but I'm just saying actually when you th think about as a scientist, when you look at these things, new, you know, with complete neutrality, you have to actually think about the disease and how you actually contain the disease and the policy decisions actually could have a long term impact uh, in the or short term and long term impact to the population, population's health. So finally, I just wanted to give you with one slide based on, you know, there is a lot of news around, you know, there are different variants and there is effectiveness. You know, my vaccine is more effective than the other. I have 70%, 80%. So this is actual data, right? So we have only data on very few uh, strains on very few vaccines. That doesn't mean other vaccines are not effective. But what is actually very interesting is with a contrast is in the J&J vaccine, which is actually effective against the UK strain and South Africa strain because they were part of the study when they actually uh, studied the vaccine in the phase three, whereas AstraZeneca is not very effective against South Africa strain. So it is remained to be seen as we add the Brazilian strain as well as the Indian strain now called Delta. Um, and so we'll have to see how these vaccines fare against them. Uh, a lot of people believe that they will be effective because I think the reason is the S protein is critical for the entry into the cell. And even though there are a lot of variants and mutations do happen, but that probably hasn't changed the conformation of that structural or the shape of that protein, because if it changes its shape, it will not fit into the pocket of ACE2 receptor and it will not get into the cell. So that's probably the reason why these vaccines maintaining a solid efficacy against various variants. But we have to continue to study and bring data to make sure that that is the case. So one thing I just wanted to leave you with is when you look at Pfizer and Moderna of 94% efficacy and Johnson & Johnson efficacy of 72%, there is a big difference between how they structured or designed their clinical trials. In the case of Pfizer and Moderna, their endpoint in the initial clinical trial was any symptoms of um, uh, COVID. So they did not look at whether a person is actually become infected or not. They actually look for symptoms and they said, okay, 90, more than 90% efficacy against the symptoms. Whereas in the case of Johnson & Johnson, they not only looked at symptoms, but they also had a positive test right? Positive COVID test as part of the protocol. A lot of people believe that's the reason why they're actually only 72%, because even both Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccine uh, recipients can get infected, uh, but they don't progress to a disease because antibodies quickly come and take care of the virus. Whereas in the case of Johnson & Johnson, because they used a COVID test as one of the outcomes they probably the reason why they are actually um, you know less effective on the paper compared to uh, Pfizer and Moderna. I hope you can understand the difference there. One is looking at whether a person have the virus or the virus components in you know through the exposure versus actually showing the symptoms. 
But in both cases, that the biggest benefit of all these vaccines are they all seem to um, to reduce the incidence of severe disease, which is close to 90% or above for all of these vaccines, because that's what we are after. Getting a minor mild infection is not a bad thing, but progressing into a severe disease and death is what we need to prevent. So my message to all of you is as infectious diseases students, because I studied HIV virus for my postdoc, is that we not only have to make a living based on what we learn, but we also have a societal and social responsibility as these things are continued to come because nobody can stop uh, these viruses from, uh, you know, maybe it's a zoonotic virus coming from animals to humans, because as we continue to be, um, you know, very complex, going to be a very complex society with world travels and, and, uh, and the economy is extremely connected. So these things can pop up anytime. So that, not only we actually provide the scientific expertise to study and provide to, to provide mitigation as well as treatment and control strategies, but we also play a huge role in our own small world of influence, influencing the society to take the necessary steps to contain, because otherwise it can actually destroy a country, destroy a certain population. And the more people educated, the more people understand it, the more people actually follow the, the control measures and the mitigation actions. So masking, physical distancing, they're all important. It's a very difficult in a society like India where uh, we have um, a substantial amount of uh, uh, you know, people population density, but still we can actually manage it. So Kerala actually did a good job early on, but I think uh, super spreader events like the elections probably you know, got out of control. But unfortunately, that's what happens um, in uh, when when things actually, you know, we we take uh, breaks off of uh, uh, control measures. OK, thank you so much. And as I said, I will be very happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope it was educational and, and uh, informative for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The session, the session is all queries. queries. The participants can post their queries in the chat box or ask directly to the speaker by unmuting the microphone. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Kaka. Yeah, Kaka. Okay. Uh, okay, Dr. John Shin Smith is one of. I am Mohan, Sri uh, Sangra College currently working at Sri Sangra College currently. And the speaker, John Shane Smith, is one of the close friend of my friend Joseph Simon. And he's working at the University of Virginia. And I actually, he suggested John's name. Then I asked him for a scientist who can cover the COVID 19 and the vaccine issues and Dr. John's name was occasionally come across in our conversations and I know his name but I never met him and he's one of the pioneer in pharmacology field from our state living in USA and I think the audience agree with that. It's a wonderful speech, wonderful class and happy with our choice. And now my question, one of my questions is, do we really need to vaccinate people who have actually got the disease? Yeah, so that's actually a question uh, that came up in the uh, here as well, uh, especially now we know that uh, natural infection confers protection for a substantial amount of time. But the but the data and the studies are actually um, very few. Um, the data and the study are very few. But the part of the reason is, based on some of the most recent publications, these responses actually vary among people. It's not consistent. Some people have even six to eight months after natural infection a substantial level of both antibodies and memory cells and provide protection, whereas others don't. So now, at least in the US, the recommendation is if you have a natural infection, do not need to vaccine for at least 90 days or 120 days, but you still go ahead and take a vaccine so that we know that you can actually have a 
a protective infection. So my oldest son, he got it. He got COVID. He's 24 now. He got COVID last year from his school. Uh, he's going to law school, and and uh, it was in November he got infected, and he got he took his vaccine, Johnson and Johnson vaccine, uh, in May. And uh, you know, as I said earlier, Johnson and Johnson is a single dose vaccine. Usually, people do not have a a, a big reaction after the dosing because normal people will have to develop antibodies after the vaccinations, whereas he had a, a substantial reaction to it for the first for 36 to 40 hours. So what that means is he actually did have a substantial amount of immunity in his system even after six months. So again, it varies, whereas my daughter on the other side, she also got it from her school. Uh, COVID, actual COVID infection, it was very mild infection that she had. She took the Pfizer vaccine, but she had no reaction. So she's probably one of those people who did not have a good amount of humoral and uh, cell mediated immunity after the first infection. So that's the reason why there is still a recommendation. However, my, I conclude by saying that in, in a situation like where we are in India, if you have a natural infection, because we know that it do provide some level of protection, our focus should be on vaccinating healthy people so that not many, you know, very few doses that are available is conserved for people who are at the highest risk. Okay, thank you. One more question. What do you think? Kerala should they have a vaccine research center or and a vaccine manufacturing unit as Kerala is one of the state in India. Most number of aged people and diabetes, it, it, Kerala is considered as a diabetic center of India and uh, highly traveled people and also having a lot of virus diseases like chikungunya, dengue, West Nile, or influenza, etc. And do we really, it's time for our state to institute a vaccine research center or a vaccine manufacturing center? What do you what are your thought about it? I, I personally think, um, you know, a, you know, see, there are there are a couple of uh, uh, interesting things about uh, uh, about vaccines development, right? So, basic research is actually very well doable. I was in a call recently uh, with the government um, representative from Kerala, and they were actually exploring a very similar thought process. And I also saw some um, some discussions in the in the Niamasaba as well. So, so I think you know, having establishing a basic research uh, infrastructure in Kerala, I think it's actually long overdue. We have the capability, we have the talent, uh, like many of you in this call who are educated in microbiology, and, and we should be able to. And I think there are a lot of, um, in fact, I introduced one of my classmates from uh, veterinary school he's from Cochin as well and he is actually one of the one of the professors at the University of Texas um, medical Southwest Medical Center uh, I introduced him because he's actually an expert in virology as well and I what I was telling them was they should be thinking about but it has to be deliberate we cannot have a half-hearted effort which means that it can be a public private partnership where investment needs to come in to make sure the infrastructure is there with, with the, when it comes to technology, capability and equipments. And also it is actually sometimes what happens is you bring in equipments, but you don't have any follow up funding for maintenance of those equipments and actually continue to support and it changes with the government. And we cannot have that if you have a solid uh, research program. That's why in India, there are very little private public partnership. The only one I'm really aware of, one in Bangalore called the, I think the Department of Biotechnology has a facility in Bangalore, which had substantial amount of investment, I think 200, 300 million dollars. So we need to have such a massive investment in order to do that. I think chikungunya, dengue, all of these things, actually, you know, Kerala has it. I totally support it. It's a great idea, but it requires a very determined, solid strategy. And in order to fund this and fund this not only short term, but long term. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hope you can also contribute. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, sir. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for having in such an informative section with your crystal life talk. Uh, my question is that does super mutation of viral body will be effectively for a vaccination? Uh, means uh, how a vaccination will be effective on mutant strain? 
So I think, um, you know, the see that at least in the case of COVID, uh, can the virus mutate to a level that they actually use a totally different mechanism for entry into the cell and multiplication? Absolutely possible. I'm not saying, you know, we can never predict and I don't want to second guess on nature, right? The nature is actually smarter than us. But the but based on the current thought processes, particularly for this virus, uh, you know, it requires that mechanism for entry and targeting that spike protein was smart uh, and identifying that tar uh, that as a target was smart. So at least we know that's how it actually works today. Can it something else can happen? Yes. And if that happens, if it uses a different mechanism for entry into the cell, of course, these vaccines will not protect. However, the, the, the good news about all of this is we, we through this uh, pandemic, we brought to the forefront uh, this mRNA technology, right? Because we know we can react very quickly to a pandemic situation, assuming we have the right target and this mRNA Elicit, able to produce the protein and elicit immune response that can block the target. So I am hopeful that even if we have such a, a massive variant of the virus, we could still respond, um, you know, to a situation uh, like that with the te with the capability and technology that we have. But you know, again, nature is much smarter than us, and we have to run much faster than the nature. Can it be possible? Maybe. OK, sir. Uh, and also even vaccinated uh, peoples are also affected by this disease, even after uh, taking vaccination over two months. And uh, in case of uh, multiple disorder type person, even um, many persons uh, from India are affected by uh, diabetics, pressure, like diseases, etc. No? So how these uh, vaccination will be going to be effective uh, if a person is with multiple disorder? So see, the there are certainly you know people have immune disorders, right? Immune disorders can have an impact on how an immune response is actually elicited. But based on I was actually reading about that last night, anticipating a question like this, and what I have learned is based on the data that we have in the U.S. and you know, people with diabetes as well as cardiovascular diseases, they all actually have a reasonable immune response. Uh, from the vaccinations that we have here. And similar data is actually available in, from Israel as well. And so the vaccination is still is a better choice in these patients than actually having them to suffer through uh, uh, the, the disease. So even for diabetes patients, for example, they are no more um, higher risk to contract the infection compared to the normal population. However, once they are infected, the progression of the disease is really bad in the case of people with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. And for diabetes, they, the, the hypothesis is that diabetes itself actually modulates people's immune, immune, immune system. So that's actually the reasons why, one of the reasons people believe that it's more severe in diabetic patients. In the case of cardiovascular patients, obviously when you have issues around um, your oxygen exchange in the lungs, as well as any kind of cytokine, storm in your body, cardiovascular patients are going to suffer. So I think you know, the current theory is that it's better to vaccinate even those people and then actually taking the risk otherwise. But why there is vaccine breakage? There are a couple of ways the vaccine can break. So if you look at um, the any of these vaccines, they have they all have to have some kind of a cold chain maintenance until it's actually ready to be dosed. So in countries like India or especially many developing nations, even in U.S., once you go to the rural areas and, you know, the United States is not just the New York, right? So we have extremely rural uh, areas in the country where even we don't have robust Internet, for example, right? So places like that, when we actually transport uh, vaccines, any time, any point of time, if you can't maintain that cold chain, the effectiveness of vaccines will go away. So you are essentially dosing water, that, you know, pure water, inject, water for injection rather than the actual vaccine. So that's one of the common cause of vaccine failure. And the second common cause of vaccine failure is, as I mentioned earlier, different population reacts differently uh, and also their immune system have primed differently over time in their life. So that could actually have an impact. And those two could actually contribute to the vaccine breakage. And the third one often is 
you know, people not following vaccine regimen. They say that, oh, I am vaccinated, but probably they might have taken only one dose. They have failed to show up for the second dose, for example, for various reasons. I remember my parents, um, they, are, they live in court time. When they went to the first vaccine, it was much easier. Uh, but when for when for the second dose, what happened was they have to go and put their, this has actually happened before the big outbreak in April, but still they had to put their name in the morning and they had to wait until three o'clock before they got the vaccine. So how many old people, they are 80, my father is 82 and my mom is 77. How many people actually will have the patience and the health to wait in line for uh, you know, six, seven hours? Luckily, they had a friend who actually took them to their, their house near court time, so they didn't have to. Otherwise, my dad's nature, he would have gone back. So are they vaccinated? Yes, I took one vaccine, but I did not do second vaccine because the infrastructure for delivering the second vaccine was not conducive for the old age people. So all of this actually contribute to the vaccine breakage, not just necessarily the failure of the vaccine. So there's a question in the chat box. Will the corona variants cause death in a person who has got both do doses of the vaccine? So the answer to that question is potentially yes, because as I said, there are very few vaccines are studied against all these variants, right? And, and variants are continuously evolving. And so, so in many cases, what I've understood that these variants, what they do is they make the virus more infectious. That means they can transmit more readily and they can actually get into the cells very, very fast. So those are those are the difference between the variants and that eventually end up in severe disease. As you saw the efficacy of these vaccines, they are 95%, 96% effective. So there are still about two or 3% who actually go through severe disease and they could die, but it's better to protect 97, 98% of the people than not protecting anyone. So that's the principle of vaccination, right? So whether the, the vaccine is, has to be administered every year? So we don't know that that's being studied, um, that whether it needs to be uh, dosed because, um, you know, of course, from a pharmaceutical company perspective, uh, you know, they would love to have everyone dose every year. So it's actually not only good for them, good for the business, good actually to guarantee certain level of uh, 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 immunity in the in the, the population. However, think about this way that, you know, vaccinating 5 billion people every year is not easy. You need a lot of vaccines. So it's, it's practically it is extremely difficult. However, what we are learning from the data or the predictive models actually say that some in many cases, these vaccines could actually provide immunity up to two to three years. But we don't know. We don't know that because we don't have the data. But at least based on what we know now, at least eight months they do protection. So we have to continuously monitor and see. In very rich countries like the US and maybe you know Western European countries, maybe you can afford to have a second dose or even a booster dose every year. But when you go to developing nations, it's not practical uh, to, to not only make sure people enough doses are available, financially it is huge uh, burden on, on, the, on the country. And thirdly, how do you distribute and uh, you know make sure there is adherence? And my hope and pray is that these vaccines do provide long-term protection. Uh, why there are two doses for AstraZeneca and single dose for Johnson and Johnson, even though both are vector vaccines? Yes, I think you know as I said, it's all based on the clinical trials that they have actually designed. And in the case of Johnson and Johnson, they actually designed their trial based on. So, so, so they had actually studies done in monkeys, and they they saw that there was an actually enough uh, antibody or immune response to protect. So that's why they went for a single dose study. In the case of AstraZeneca, even though they did complete a phase three trial, if you look back at the literature, you'll see that they had a problem with the dosing, and they also had a, a very interesting results. Uh, that half the dose give more protection than the full full dose. So there was some confusion on their trial and their trial designed based on a booster dose. So that's why they recommend. However, based on data that is available from Johnson & Johnson, et cetera, 
probably the reason why they are actually comfortable now delaying the second dose to 12 weeks and in some cases they even say four to six months so uh, it, it it doesn't need to be different but i think it's all based on the short time everybody had and the kind the way they actually designed their trial and that's for which they got the approval for even after vaccination why in some people the antibody level is not rising so again as i said this must be has to do with the immune immune system of people and also the kind of vaccines they got and uh, whether the vaccine was actually uh, vaccine had the ingredients that are effective at the time of vaccination and also whether people actually did take the follow the protocol and taken the booster dose all of this needs to be established because what happens actually to be very honest with you you know media sometimes do not do justice uh, to science right so when there is a breakage of vaccination or if there is actually not somebody have an antibody response those are the type of news that actually come fill the media compared to the thousands and thousands of people who actually um, you know uh, who got protection because that's not a news item that is expected right so again when you hear these things you have to ask the question what happened so there has to be a reason why um, you know, antibody titers were not good or immune response was not good in a particular vaccine or it depending on if it's a new vaccine, they're going a trial, maybe that vaccine is not effective as good as the other vaccine. So all of those questions needs to be asked and understood for in a particular case. But it's not a it's not a generalized statement that we can rely on because we know that, you know, thousands and thousands or millions of people are vaccinated and they all have, you know, majority of them do have an immune response. Sir, during the preparation of COVID-19 vaccine for children, would the approach to clinical trials be different? So actually the, the trials may not be different, uh, but the problem that we have is actually to find enough cases in the population, especially in the control group, to say that the vaccine was actually protected. So the current, the current trial, trial, I'm hearing an echo, hopefully you can hear me. So the current trials is actually primarily focused on the safety as well as whether they can actually have an immune response that is actually comparable. So those are the type of trials that Pfizer has actually conducted up to 12 years of age, and they had probably a few cases to demonstrate that it is effective in protection. But as I said earlier, less than 10 years old, they have a natural resistance to this disease for some, you know, for so for some reason. Maybe it is ACE2 inhibitor or not. John. So someone wants to know whether the vaccine is effective in people having autoimmune diseases as well as blood cancer. So I don't have a whole lot of data on that uh, because you know the 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 mechanism in which the immune response against this particular protein should actually confer protection. But I, if you if you want, I can actually specifically look into that and maybe respond to. Dr. Mohan, so that way he can actually provide you the feedback. I specifically, I don't have data to answer that question. Is there any difference between efficiency and effectiveness? So again, we don't have that data, right? So the efficiency, you know, I don't know, whoever asked that question, can they define what they meant by efficiency? Efficiency in dosing, efficiency in production, efficiency in generating uh, immune response uh, because what we know now that you know based on as I said earlier all of these vaccines are really good and really efficient in eliciting an immune response and they do confer a substantial amount of protection except you know there's some questions around the cyanopharm but they again reconfirming that they do have effectiveness but otherwise these are all showing 70 80 percent effectiveness and they're all efficient in uh, pr producing an immune response. But if you think about efficiency in manufacturing and production, of course, mRNA beats everybody else because it's much easier to uh, produce. But when you think about efficiency of distribution of these vaccines, mRNA vaccines are the worst in efficiency in distribution. So again, you know, think about the efficiency being actually as a efficient to uh, you know, any of these things, manufacturing process, immune response, distribution, you can look at all of those. So each vaccine is different based on that. 
so what about the efficiency of vaccines that can be inhaled rather than injected so we don't have any inhaled vaccines yet so i can't comment on that uh, a person is asking the reason why vaccine has started an autoimmune disorder in some patient so again we don't know whether the actually the vaccination elicited or they already had a predisposition for autoimmune disease again this is a if there is a particular case i'm personally not aware of a case but again you know th those are the type of uh, situation that we need to study right because even johnson and johnson vaccine as i said they actually produced a disseminated coagulation event in some patients i think it's about, about out of 6 out of 6 million or something why that happens they're still being explored i don't think it's completely understood sir a person somebody nobody can hear me can you hear me yes sir you are audible okay uh, a person has told uh, a doctor has told us not to take vaccine for people who are allergic to medicines like paracetamol which is used to treat symptoms like fever after being vaccinated and what is your opinion in the use of vaccine for people with such allergies so again as i said earlier pe people who have a history of severe allergic reactions could have allergic reactions against these vaccines right so that's one of the reasons why you know in the us etc when we get vaccinated we are asked to you know the people to stay at the vaccination center for at least 30 minutes to for any immediate reaction but of course we we have to follow through but again my recommendation is you know compared to contracting the disease uh, it is it is really good to at least try one vaccine one dose and see if it actually produces a severe reaction and but i would definitely take that vaccine only in the case of in a hospital setting just in case but i don't think paracetamol specifically a paracetamol reaction could have an impact against the covid vaccine unless any they actually do share any ingredients because i don't exactly know the ingredients of covaxin as well as covi shield um, you know beyond the adenovirus and the uh, vector you know what are the other agents that they have in the vaccine itself i have no idea whether they share that with paracetamol if immune response is not raised against a vaccine whether they have to get vaccinated by another vaccine they could try right because uh, again i don't know whether we have currently testing antibody testing to ensure that somebody who vaccinated uh, has an immune response we can definitely do it but i don't know we routinely offer that as a service in india but in india or anywhere but if you happen to know that you don't have an immune response by because you went and did an antibody testing you can certainly try another vaccine and and sometimes it can have an impact but you know it you know we will have to see but if you taken pfizer vaccine you don't have immune response and if everything else is equal and you follow you know the vaccine was maintained well and everything but moderna may not actually elicit a immune response so you could actually try a totally different platform if that happens but again it's a hypothetical question i believe because i don't know how many countries or people follow up with an antibody testing except in the case of research research environments we know that diabetes is a genetic disease usually comes in the age of about 45 and is there any chance of getting diabetes early after vaccinated and is there any case of studies no there shouldn't be any you know of course there is no there are no studies but there shouldn't be any connection between vaccination and diabetes or vaccination causing diabetes so i have a question yeah so how effective uh, are the vaccines in long term prevention of covid 19 so as i said we are still studying that right so we have we know now uh, that at least pfizer and moderna they give at least 8 months of protection because they are the first vaccines they are developed and they actually dosed uh, people first so that is that area is actually being evolved and that's the biggest unknown in this uh, in the in this effort 
uh, because we just didn't have time to wait for that, right? So we have to continue to learn. And the, luckily, uh, all the companies are actually studying the longevity of protection um, as they those people. So hopefully we will we will get that. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think uh, appreciate. I have actually unfortunately another meeting to go to. Uh, really nice meeting you. Good luck. I always like uh, students who actually spend time to learn infectious diseases. It's a fascinating field. Never lose heart and uh, be good scientists and good citizens because when you develop good data, solid data, that actually helps uh, helps people. And uh, I have actually seen situations where people try to create data, never go there. And we don't need that. And uh, we I wish you good luck and hopefully you all become shining stars in the future. Thanks again. Thank you very much, sir, for finding time and joining with us. I invite Ms. Gayatri Amma for the vote of thanks. Good evening, one and all. Now that we have come across a wonderful session on COVID-19 vaccine development and the advantages and disadvantages of the currently available vaccines by Dr. John Shane's Matthew, Executive Director, Organon, New Jersey, USA. We are going through such a serious situation wherein the pandemic has enclosed literally each and everyone in the world. Hence, this topic gains extreme, extreme value and prominence. Dr. John gave us a deep insight on vaccine development strategies and the pros and cons of available, available vaccines. I believe that this talk was very informative for all of us, and I use this opportunity to express my gratitude towards Dr. John. Sir, thank you for your scholarly and informative talk. Then I thank all the members who have joined here and thereby making this event a great success. Once again, I thank everyone for the support. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.